Welcome, everyone, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast that dares to talk about setback and failure, but not so we can commiserate. It's so we can elevate. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our mission today is to offer you the hope that your crucible experiences, those tragedies and challenges you faced or are facing at this moment, don't define you. They refine you. They did not happen to you. They happened for you. And no one I know, and trust me, I've gone through all the people I know, uh, no one I know uh, knows that better than the founder of Beyond the Crucible, the host of this program, and my friend, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, uh, this, this, is a, this is a special episode because this is the second time our guest has been with us. And um, this is the, I believe, 28th. Thousandth, two hundred and seventy second time we've had a guest on from Australia. So, <laughs> <laughs> indeed, and you can never have too many Aussies on the podcast. So uh, it is all uh, good. <laughs> that'll tweet, as they say. Uh, the guest about whom we are speaking, listener, is Dr. Glenn Williams, uh, with more than twenty five years working as a psychologist, C suite leader, and executive coach, working with leaders in more than forty countries. Dr. Williams founded LCP Global in twenty ten. Through his doctoral research and the working with thousands of high capacity leaders, he discovered the connection between personal and corporate well being and how together they unlock resilience and breakthrough performance. He asked me not to read all of his bio, so I'm going to skip a paragraph and go to the, what he would say is the most important part. Glenn and his wife, Natalie, live on the sunshine coast of Queensland, Australia, and have two adult children, Ben and Chloe. And we will be talking um, because uh, a lot about this because Glenn has a new book out called When Leaders Are Lost, Moving Beyond Disappointment, Failure, and Hurt to Redefine Success. Warwick, you know a little bit about some of that stuff, so this should be a fascinating conversation. Absolutely. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for being here. Um, I love chatting with you before, and for folks that want the full backstory of Glenn, it's an earlier podcast, but I'm sure we'll be touching on his story because it's woven throughout his book, which for those on YouTube, I will hold up if I can hold it up straight, which is a bit of a challenge, uh, when leaders are lost. Um, and I loved reading this book. Um, I definitely had moments in my life when I certainly felt uh, lost um, and it was in a bit of a dark pit. and didn't know uh, how to get out of it. So, uh, it is profoundly true. And um, before we sort of get into the book, Len, I'd love to hear a bit about, and obviously we've talked, so I have some idea of the answer, but just the listeners here, uh, what prompted you to write this book when leaders are lost? Because clearly, it's very personal and there's a mission behind it, but what led you to write this book? No, thank you. And great to be here, guys. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I think, you know, Warwick, as you know, I, you know, work in that space of, you know, executive coaching. So, you know, you you know, I'm working with leaders, you know, every day. And, uh, you know, there's no shortage of, of books on on success, you know, uh, five steps to success and, you know, uh, you know, how to make a million in a day, you know, and, and so on. And, but, uh, you know, we, we tend to forget, uh, you know, there's, there's often lots of other experiences, some that uh, people find difficult to write about. And you've, You've touched on many of these um, o over the time very, very well. But, you know, disappointments and failures and hurts that, um, you know, can be quite defining for many people and in many cases even prevent, you know, leaders from really um, fulfilling their potential and going on to greater things. Um, they get stuck, um, you know, where they're at. They get, and, and I use the term, they get lost. Um, you know, and so, you know, one of the things that we found often is, um, and even for me, with you know difficult transitions, difficult um, crises that occur in our lives, um, it's very easy to flounder. Um, sometimes, if it's not easy to talk about things, um, you 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 just close up, you withdraw, you you um, go you know fall very much within yourself, and you don't open up. And I think what that does it it narrows your opportunities, but it prevents you from looking at your life differently and exploring how, how some of these uh, difficult moments in our lives can actually be a real catalyst for for great things to come um, but you know that seems very far removed from us at the moment when we're actually in the crisis or or not yet through it yeah I mean just to introduce the subject because 
clearly this is very personal for you. You had a, I guess, a business, um, I don't know if the word is failure, but it's certainly a business uh, transition, you know, an organizational setback. You've had some, you know, personal devastations, if you will, tragedies with, you know, loss of a son and father-in-law. Just, you know, talk just a little bit about, um, because that had to inform the writing of this book. You know, certainly the organizational challenge you went through. So talk about kind of what you went through and the link between that and writing the book. Well, you know, it was interesting. I, I think, um, you know, now I can look back on some of those things and and uh, even like wish that I'd uh, managed some of those areas differently um, or responded differently. I think many, many people go through difficult transitions, uh, you know, work transitions, career transitions. They're, they're not all... Uh, disastrous, but I think at, at the time when they occur, usually we're unprepared for them, and, and uh, in it, it gets us to question, or leads us to question our value, our self worth, our identity. Uh, it brings us to a point where we begin to question, wow, you know, has it all been worth it? You know, I've invested heavily in this position or in this role or in this life and career, and now it's amounted to nothing. And and actually, that's a, it's a bad statement to make, really, because it doesn't mean that everything that has preceded you amounts to nothing. It just means that you can't see the significance of all of those things that, you know, those successes and achievements and things that you have done for good. Um, you know, it doesn't change those things. They they did occur. They Those good things have happened, but they seem quite removed from the moment when you're in that space of not being able to see that because all you're focused on is being in this incredibly uncomfortable place of, of you know, I'm in this, um, you know, some call it a desert experience, but I'm in this moment where I can't see what lies ahead. Um, I can't see opportunities. I'm not sure who to talk to. I feel embarrassed uh, uh, or even a little bit ashamed because, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with my understanding of failure. And even though I may not have failed per se, there's a sense of, you think, well, gee, maybe I did fail. What did I do wrong? Um, you know, so there's lots of questions, and in that maze, uh, I guess if you like, we we get lost because we, you know, we we go deeper into some of those things, and we go to a dark place very quickly. And and for me, uh, where I, you know, um, obviously a little bit further down the track, but you know, losing a son, it's um, of course it's deeply personal. Lots of questions there, um, and, I, and I think. You know, nothing else matters. Uh, you know, I, you know, you you would, you know, I would do anything to have my son back. Um, but you know, you have no bandwidth, you have no capacity, you have no. Um, there's almost a state of nothingness. Uh, you you're just floundering. And that's so true. I mean, it really leads into one of the key concepts of the book, which is the lostness of the leader. And so, for many leaders, they may be. You talk early in the book about the amount of you know business failures and uh, you know uh, the, the amount of people that suffer burnout. Sixty-two percent said they were struggling with burnout often, extremely often. So you've got burnout, you've got downsizing, being laid off, you know, uh, forced to resign, your business um, tanks, and there's a sense of lostness. I talk about that, and obviously that's linked a lot to identity. And I love that phrase because it it does feel like you're wandering in the desert and you don't know where to go, who you are, everything you thought about yourself and who you are has been challenged. It's been destroyed. And you look in the mirror and it's like, I don't know who that person is anymore. I thought I was a CEO. I thought I was a you know successful person, uh, you know, dad, mom, parent. I have no idea who I am. So talk about that profound concept of the lostness of a leader. Yeah. You know, and there are degrees of lostness as well, mate. So, you know, I, I think all of our, you know, growing up in our culture, um, all of our definitions of leadership revolve around success. And so all of a sudden, if we're not um, experiencing success uh, or success has not occurred uh in the way that we expected, then then ultimately uh, we failed. You know, there's a perception that we failed or we convince ourselves that we failed because success has not turned out to be what we thought it would be. And and because of that, um, you know, 
if we feel like we've failed, there's a sense of shame that often comes with that. Um, and we convince ourselves that we can't talk to anybody else about it because nobody else is going to fully understand or appreciate the nature of my failure because they've perhaps never experienced something similar to themselves for themselves. And so with that, um, because we've convinced ourselves that nobody else will understand and we don't want other people to have a different view of us. Another, and this is work is where it does come back to identity because, you know, our identity is very much wrapped up in our success as a leader. And if we perceive that we're not succeeding uh, in, in the current tense or present tense, uh, then uh, we don't want people to know that we're not succeeding because we don't want to present to them uh, something that is different than that. We, if we, own up to our failure and own up to our disappointment or own up to our hurt or our lack of success, then we're actually not portraying that image of success that we want other people to believe about us. And talk about just, you know, that whole uh, issue of uh, success. I think later on you talk about success panic. There's this idea that success is so important. It can be like toxic success that can lead to uh, multiple marriages and um, as you write, you don't know your kids and uh, you're successful, but by what definition? I mean, are you fulfilled, happy? Even in my own world, it's not a comparison, but you know, my dad was married uh, three times, my mother twice. I was fortunately from the last marriage of each, so I didn't have to go through that, but there are consequences of that. Irrespective of forgetting whose fault it is, Divorce is painful. And um, so, yeah, I mean, just talk a bit about that whole, I don't know if it's success myth and, you know, you you hit the wall when you lose a business or have to resign and you're confronted with reality, which is just not fun. So talk a bit about that success myth that is so destructive on people's souls yeah. and relationships. And uh, sometimes you have to hit the wall before you realize how bad it really is, which was bad even before you hit the wall, if that makes some degree of sense. Yeah, I, well, it's interesting, Warwick. I, I think with, um, you know, for all the good things that, you know, uh, social media can can often bring, you know, the downside to that is, you know, what we often are, are more frequently uh, exposed to is, you know, is, you know, everybody's dreams and, you know, we see their good lives, we don't see the, the downside or the darker side of their life. And usually, you know, if, whether it's um, whether it's your Facebook account or Instagram account, you see all these wonderful photos and, and you know, they're highlights really. And, and, uh, and you know, look at some of these things and say, wow, these people have got a great life. I wish my life was like that. And you think, what have I done wrong? You know, um, you know, but but I think there is that element of even in business. Um, you know, you we we see people, we know people who, uh, if you like, um, in our eyes, have been incredibly successful. Maybe they've built a great career. Maybe they've built a, an incredible business or organization. Um, it, people love working for them. You know, they they they're constantly hitting their sales targets. They're growing twenty percent every month. You know, uh, you know that's our our view, and that's what is pushed. Um, constantly through a whole lot of different messaging and channels, you know, of what success is. So I guess if we're not achieving that and if, um, then then we, in a way, we're not succeeding or there's a perception that we're not succeeding. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget, I you know, it was a major bank and this is, you know, 20 odd years ago now, but I'll never forget uh, a global bank uh, and the CEO sharing um, a little bit of his story and the whole premise of the story was, this is a success story. Look what has happened to this bank. It's amazing. It's grown. It's captured greater market share and got a great reputation. And and literally just a couple of paragraphs further down, it talks about how in the middle of all that, the CEO of the bank had lost his marriage and he's now, you know, and he, he looks forward to, to seeing his kids on weekends and 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 then something incredibly profound, he says, I guess my view of success was different to what I understand it to be today. That the success that I thought I had I had achieved and the success that everybody else now attaches to my accomplishments actually does not measure up to what is important to me today. And I thought that that was really, really interesting. 
And I know we can say it tongue in cheek that everybody needs a good crisis because a crisis will often, you know, as we said earlier, just uh, it, it forces us to kind of wrestle with our beliefs and the assumptions we make about our life and how we define success. But if we see success as being so much more than just, uh, you know, finishing a great project, building a great career, um, you know, being a great leader, um, you know, achieving, you know, hitting these sales targets every week, but we see it in the context of a much wider thing of, you know, here's the impact I'm having in my family. I have, you know, I, I, you know, I love my spouse and I can't wait to be with my kids and I'm building and feeding on my kids and I'm preparing them for life. And I want to make sure that they can be resilient and robust as they pursue their dreams and that they've got somebody on their cheer squad that no matter what happens to them, they know that I'm cheering for them. And if they don't quite get it right or they make a mistake or, you know, whatever, I'm there still cheering them on in spite of all of that. I think if we can see success as being more than just success in one part of our lives, but success as an indicator of how we're giving back and how we're feeding and investing into the lives of others and investing back into the world uh, rather than what we can get out of it. Um, you know, I think that would serve us much better. But, I, you know, it's hard when you've grown up and you've got that strong uh, achievement bent, you know, that success drive. Um, we all want to experience that. But I think uh, there's nothing wrong with success, uh, but, you know, it's a matter of balancing that view of success with, and, and I, as I would say, redefining that to where it's you giving back and you investing in, a, in a others, which actually helps to build a, an ongoing legacy of success rather than just you building an overnight success and, and seeing that crumble when something negative or something destructive happens. Yeah, it's so well said. I mean, one of the things you talk about is how will you measure your life? And really, another mm -hmm. way of saying is what is success? And um, yeah, I know for me, um, sometimes we're given gifts of other people's crucibles, other people's mistakes that we can benefit from. And uh, so, you know, obviously you grew up very differently than uh, a lot of people. But when you grow up with as much power and money and influence as Certainly in Australia, you know, John Fairfax Limited, Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, you know, all these big newspapers. Um, certainly in Sydney, the name Fairfax is like, I don't know, Vanderbilt, Bush, I mean, it, it, Kennedy. I mean, it's, it's a big, big deal. And all these parties with successful business folks and politicians all trying to impress each other about how wonderful they were. And it just seems so empty. And, you know, without judging my parents, just the, you know, um, marriages, you know, several marriages, I remember thinking, yeah, I don't want that. I don't want any of that. I mean, I've always worked hard at everything I did, but I knew from an early age I wanted to be married, you know, once, hopefully not multiple times that I've been married like 34 years to my wife, uh, three adult children. I, I knew I wanted to spend time with them. I wanted to be there for their soccer games and dance recitals and that was a high, and you talk a lot about values and virtues in your book. It was a high value of mine. So it's, I'm not saying I was so smart and enlightened. I just saw the other side growing up. I saw success. I saw status and privilege and respect. It's like, I don't, I'm not against success, but you know, I want to work hard and be successful in my own way. But yet, I wanted to have a loving family who I su supported. So again, it's not saying I'm so enlightened. I had the gift of other people's mistakes and crucibles. So talk about maybe yeah. the way out of the pit, if you will, about the right way to measure your life, the right way to look at success in a more of a holistic way. Yeah, you know, again, you know, we're very accustomed to to identifying, you know, let's say a set of core values if we're working in a business context or, or for an organization. And, um, you know, and, and yet, you know, you, you would know as well as I do, you know, those values might look impressive. They're up on a list of, you know, it's a frame nicely in the, in the foyer as you walk into an office or something. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're, uh, you know, that they're being you know, fulfilled or carried out or, you know, demonstrated uh, each day. I think in a similar way, we, you know, we as individuals have values, but we often don't think about them per se. You know, we... Um, you know, we would, you know, oh yeah, we think integrity and honesty and, you know, we, we look at some of these character, um, uh, you know, servanthood, whatever, we, we think they're important things, generosity, courage, uh, but we often don't think about them regularly in the context of a normal day. And so 
often when I'm uh, coaching um, a leader, um, you know, I'll encourage them just to take one, just choose one. You know, if there's one value or virtue, and, I'll, and the difference between those two things, by the way, the reason I differentiate between values and virtues is because I think in a way we've lost the intrinsic value of the word value. <laughs> you know, you, um, you know it, 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 we say these are the values that we adhere to and commit to, but uh, when they're deemed to be inconvenient or, or, or you know, um, uh, or, or not, you know, not relevant for a particular day or moment, or we want to violate that because we've got a decision to make over here and doesn't quite line up with that. We make that change, and then and then we go back and say those values are important to us. Alexander Harvard would say a virtue is an intrinsic value that is so practiced and deeply ingrained in a person's life that it becomes just an indelible part of their identity. That to violate that would cause immense in internal conflict. And so when I'm coaching a leader, I'll say, look, for this coming week or month, if you like, just focus on one value. If it's the value of courage, for example, or resilience, or uh, or or if it's um, you know generosity, how do you want to see that expressed in your life, in your work, in your family, in your in your relationships moving forward? And 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 then we start to think about, you know, how do we make that a reality? And even just by focusing on that one thing. I think it creates a win for that person. And so when you talk about redefining success and getting yourself out of a place where you deep, might be deeply lost by selecting just one value that you can focus on and, and create some very practical things to do in the, in the next week or the next day or the next month, it actually helps to bring you out of that sense of lostness because you you find some meaning, again, albeit in just one intrinsic value to begin with. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I mean, I, I like that discussion about virtues and values. It's almost like values that are truly lived out and embedded in your soul become, that's mm -hmm. virtues. It's sort of values mm -hmm. lived at the, the deepest uh, core. And one of the things I, I love about um, a lot of great phrases, you say it's impossible to lead others if you can't lead yourself. It's funny, uh, you know, my church here in, in Maryland in the U.S., uh, we have a lot of great programs. It's a, you know, missional church doing lots of good things, various places. But we're doing a series on discipleship and basically saying the first person you need to disciple is yourself. Mm. And it's, a, you know, the pastor even said, we often don't focus on that enough. And to his credit, he said, that's on me. You know, we really should have been, should be saying, you know, how do we disciple ourselves in the, in the broader context? How do we lead ourselves? How do we do that, the inner soul work? Because mm -hmm. from my perspective, and I think yours, uh, I'll overstate it a bit, but you have no business leading others or an organization if you haven't done the inner work, because typically you yeah. will cause a lot of damage to other people. I mean, we talk about forgiveness a lot. Uh, you know, if you're full of anger and bitterness, and it may be very understandable, you know, very understandable. Sometimes, as you know, unfortunately too well, it, it, it's you've done nothing and terrible things happen. But if you let it fester, what typically happens is you take it out on the people you most love. That's inevitable, mm -hmm. which you don't want to do, but you will. You know, just like sure. night follows day, it will happen. And you take it out on your coworkers. Well, try being yeah. successful in a business or an organization if you're yelling and screaming and bitter and overreacting and mistreating people, they'll leave. You will be guaranteed not to succeed. In the book, I talk about there are leaders who are lost who are still leading, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and you know, if you've gone through a crisis, uh, no matter what that crisis is, or you've gone through a very difficult transition or a messy separation or divorce, and you know there are a whole lot of issues wrapped up in that, and you've not resolved that or addressed those issues, you still might be in a leadership role. Um, but if you choose not to address or not to resolve some of those issues that have um, contributed to the crisis or have come, you know, have resulted from that crisis, but you've not given it sufficient time to to uh, to address that or to resolve those things, um, you you're leading others uh, through um, 
you know, through that lens. So, you know, if you come out of a difficult transition and you're angry about that transition and you move into a new leadership role and you're leading others, um, you know, you, it could be very much that you're saying, well, listen, uh, I don't want that to happen to me ever again. So the best way I can do that is to control my own destiny and control my 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 work environment and that very much then becomes i'm going to control others and i'm going to tell them what to do and i'm going to lead a particular way because i'm not going to be hurt that way again so you'll find that in a way leaders are lost when they don't address those sorts of issues that may, maybe led to a disappointment or a hurt or or a frustration in their life and they've chosen to sweep it under the carpet and keep going and then lead, but unfortunately lead imperfectly. And we all lead imperfectly, but to but it, to intentionally lead others, knowing that you've got unresolved hurts and disappointments and issues there in your life um, is not going to allow you to build a place where other people can flourish and where you can flourish. And I have a firm belief that if you can resolve those things and address those issues, you will flourish. And because you flourish, everybody else around you will also flourish because you're not threatened by them flourishing in your presence. You also talk in the book, which I think we're speaking about, about how crucibles can be very clarifying about yeah. what's important. And you know, nobody wants that way of having to clarify life because you, know, you get hit over the head, you can't help but stop and what's important in life. And I think this maybe comes into... Um, Really, you know, some of the profound things, or you know, the core of LCP Global, you know, the five leadership anchors, and talk about how that's obviously linked to clarifying what's important to you, and you know, maybe if for the leaders who are lost, how do you get unlost? How do you get maybe not found, but how do you find your way out of the desert? It would yeah. seem to me that those five leadership anchors are part of the key from your perspective of helping leaders not be lost anymore. So just talk about the link between that and lost and what those sure. five leadership bankers yeah. are and why they're so so critical. And and even the work we do with, you know, leadership teams, executive teams and businesses where, you know, they may not see themselves as lost work, but you know, if they've got a strategy that they're trying to implement, but it's just not happening, it's not working for them, you know, we, you know, we we say, look, let's let's use these five leadership anchors as a way to really Close the gap between what it, what it is that you're going after, what's important to you, and actually what's happening. So you know, closing that gap between strategy and execution, and it's it's no different in a business context or in a personal context. If you find yourself living a life as a leader or as a person uh, that no longer aligns with what is important to you, then you know, changes need to be made. And so, you know, the five anchors are just a, a very simple but profound, you know, evidence based framework that we've. Uh, we've come up with and identified, you know, over the last you know eight or nine years, and you know the the value of relationships uh, is important, and the quality, particularly the quality of your relationships outside of your normal working context, uh, there is uh, a direct link, or if you like, correlation between the quality of the relationships that you have outside of work and. The, the, the way you relate to people at work, you know, and so, you know, again, we say, so invest heavily, you know, in relationships that are important to you, but get, if you don't have a cheer squad around you, get a cheer squad. If you don't have an accountability relationship, then find people that you can be accountable to who are committed uh, to your growth and want to cheer you on no matter what. Uh, I think that's important. We talk about, you know, motivational drivers. You know, maybe it's a good time. We just talked about doing a decluttering exercise. Maybe it's a good time to take stock and say, look, you know, what really is important to me? What do I find um, that, that energizes me and motivates me the most? Do I have a clear sense of purpose or calling or am I just holding on to things because it's comfortable and that's the way life has always been? Uh, we talk about the importance of character and of values and resiliency and uh, the interesting thing is if you've got a clarity around the values that are important to you that actually enables you to be more resilient uh, if you don't have those values you get thrown around you know from one place to another and, and it's difficult to be resilient when you, you know, when there's no uh, stability there or consistency there and, and that's what those values can bring um, the, the fourth thing is, you know, being very intentional about making decisions, you know, the way we make decisions, being really clear about um, our mindset. Do we have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? Uh, a fixed mindset that says, well, you know, this, this, is, this it is and it's just too bad and, 
you know, I'm not willing to change, willing to learn uh, or adapt, or a growth mind that says, what can I learn from this? Uh, how can I grow from this? Um, how can I lead differently because of how this crisis has informed my life and contributed to my life? Uh, what's the legacy that I can extend as a result of that? And which then leads into this creating this new trajectory. And what we say is you get those other four anchors right and, and can align your life around those four anchors, then you get to create a whole new trajectory and model a way forward and model success in a way that may have been different to any other time in your life. And I can tell you that if you can achieve that, you'll end up modeling a um, a success that is refreshing to other people. You'll you'll model um, and and uh, and carry out a, a success that will challenge people to even think about how they might look at success and need to redefine that and revisit that uh, in their own life. And so we just find, you know, those five uh, leadership anchors create just a great little framework, a simple framework, um, you know, th very simple questions that we can, that leaders and can ask themselves every day on those five anchors. And, you know, and we call them anchors because they are anchors. They're foundational. They become a an organic, um, you know, part of your life. They're like anchors that go deep. And, and so, you know, put, practicing those and visiting those, you know, every day, every week, every month, uh, we think will create a whole new trajectory and a new life for you moving forward individually, but then also corporately if you're working with a team or working with others and leading others. You know, those last two are interesting, uh, training your personal script so you can make better decisions, creating a new success trajectory in all areas of your life. You know, we talk a fair amount about Beyond the Crucible is you can write a new story. It can be yeah. a new path, a new journey. And that's, in a sense, what you're talking about is maybe you had some old definition of success that wasn't linked to your values and certainly not your virtues. Uh, you know, your family is not what it should be. You don't really know what your kids are doing. You don't have much of a relationship. Uh, maybe your professional relationships are just more command and control. Um, yeah, a lot of things may not be successful and maybe in the right sense of that word, and you've hit a wall, you've hit a crisis. Well, now you get to get in touch with what's really important to you, your values and your virtues. You get in touch with, through these leadership anchors, quality of relationships and so many other things that serve you. And you get to write a new story. And that That's story right. uh, is one that you know, we we say lead a life in significance, life on purpose, dedicated to serving others. Talking about it more generally, it will lead to a more joyful and fulfilling life, which everybody on the planet wants a joyful and fulfilling life. Who doesn't? Sure. Every sane yeah. individual. And so by following the leadership anchors, you can write that new story that does lead to a joyful and fulfilling life. And maybe you'll be successful too from the world's perspective. It is possible, yeah. but so talk about just the importance of writing that new story and you can change the old patterns and have new patterns that become ingrained in you. People, you talk about the capacity to change and it's not easy, but it's possible if you really want it. So talk about writing that new story uh, for your life. Yeah. Yeah, you know, very briefly, I think it, it's 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 simply just a matter of acknowledging first and foremost that you that the current chapter, you know, or if you like, if it's if it's defined by a crisis, you know, that's a chapter in your life. It doesn't have to be the final chapter. Uh, you 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 might make it the final chapter uh, at your own peril, but it doesn't have to be that final chapter. It does not have to define what happens next. It will influence. It will be a catalyst for what can what, what can occur next in your life. It uh, as a result of that, it may be that you get to refine what's important in your life and what success is. Um, you know, my encouragement to people, and I understand it's difficult. Yes, a crisis can bring great clarity, but first and first, it brings confusion and hurt. You know, so you know you've got to be patient as you go through that process. Um, you might be confused. That doesn't mean you'll never be clear. It just means that right now you're in a, you're in a moment of confusion. And right now you may not feel like you've got the energy to write a new chapter. That doesn't mean that you'll never write a new chapter. Um, but just can, but just tell yourself and remind yourself that the crisis doesn't have to be the closing chapter in your life. 
And I think, you know, it's not that I owe it to myself. I think I owe it to my family. I owe it to my friends. I owe it to my colleagues. I owe it to people who know me um, that if I could come through a crisis and, and multiple crises for that matter, um, a, 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 a much more well-rounded person, a, a, a person who's not only committed to to wanting to flourish and grow and learn, but to create an environment where others can flourish and learn and grow, then that's the best thing that I can do. And so, you know, convince yourself that this chapter can close and you get to write a new chapter. And, and I think sometimes what prevents us from writing that new chapter is we can't see beyond the current one. But sometimes we can't write a new chapter because we're looking – it's like when you buy a book. Some people buy a book and they'll go straight to the end of the book to see whether or not it's got a good ending, <laughs> and that will influence whether or not they buy the book. And I, I know, Gary, you probably know people like that as well, you know, people who say, well, I'm going to buy this book. Is it worth it or not? Let me go to the end and see if it's got a good ending. If it's got a right, good ending, right. well, then I'll buy the book, you know. Um, <laughs> So, so I think you know what we what we want to do here is you know don't go too far ahead. Don't go to the end of the book. Just write the next chapter, and the next chapter might simply be, what are some of the lessons I've learned? What are some of the key takeaways? And you know how can I leverage that? You know, small steps, baby steps, moving forward. And it's so, don't be overwhelmed by getting to the end of the book. You know, it's interesting. Um, Glenn, uh, when Warwick and I were preparing for this conversation, um, he, as I said, did a lot of notes on the book. Uh, and he was like, well, you know, what Glenn's talking about isn't exactly what we do. And it, what you just said could have been pulled from anything we've ever written at Beyond the Crucible <laughs> about, yeah. I mean, that's the that's the joy that I have with this show is when guests and the host uh, have perhaps different crucibles, different experiences, even different perspectives on how to bounce back from a crucible, we tend to find the middle ground and it's it, 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 and it overlaps, which yeah. reinforces for me that the work that we're doing at Beyond the Crucible is, is the right work because uh, there are several people doing the same kind of work, maybe with different shading like you. So that's that's yeah. very encouraging. And 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 I mean, I can see Warwick smiling now because he knows yeah. that's exactly what he said when we were talking about it beforehand. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think I think you both do amazing work. Um, I, I think you know you, you're bringing out into the open conversations that need to be had, that often people sweep under the carpet because they don't know how to have them. Uh, they don't know where to start. And I think what you do in the way that you do it is you help people to frame uh, their crisis in such a way where they know that it can create. A, a new narrative, you know, eventually for them, and uh, you know, you you get a, an opportunity to to speak to people and interview people who are at different stages in their crisis. Maybe they're still early in their crisis and they're still trying to make sense of it. And you get others who have you know, maybe towards the end of it, and others who have come through it now can look back with tremendous hindsight and wisdom. Um, and I think the fact that you engage a lot of guests at different points in that crisis and even mm. after that crisis. I think you give permission to people um, to to process and to learn and to grow. And it's okay to be authentic and real in that, and it's still okay to make a mess of it, and still okay not to fully understand it and to be a little bit confused. But what you then do and what you give at the end of that is you give hope. And so I I commend you both. I just think just keep doing what you're doing because I think there's absolutely a need for for this type of work. And what you've just said, Glenn, gives me permission to do something that I told Warwick I wasn't going to do. And that is in your book, um, you list, um, I believe it's six leaders uh, that you, you set up like this. Um, uh, listed below are a few stories that have inspired and helped me through my growth as a person and, and as a leader. And they include some of the names on here. Um, uh, maybe some of you have heard of Nelson Mandela is one of the names on this list. The other name that you have probably heard of for sure is Warwick Fairfax. I'm going to ask you and embarrass Warwick at the same time, which is fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why, you know, unpack a little bit why you include Warwick on this list of folks who have inspired you. 
Yeah, really um, easily, actually. Um, you know, I was introduced to Warwick a number of years ago, and uh, Warwick didn't know me. I didn't know him. We had a couple of Zoom calls. We connected, and Warwick said, oh, you know, come around for lunch. And so I, I think, you know, I was with my boys, actually, Ben and Ryan, um, you know, and we were in Melbourne, and, and Warwick said, oh, look, why don't you come through Sydney and have lunch? And so we did. And I, I, I think – and my kids probably summed it up better than me. We drove away from Warwick's place and, you know, and, and Warwick, you know, not, not to set you up on a pedestal, but yeah, you've got some tremendous heritage and legacy there with your family name over many years. And it's, it, it um, you know, it's indicative or it defines it for many people. It's like, wow, Fairfax. I mean, there is a success story um, over many, many years and, you know, and it's status, it's money, it's, it's, um, you know, um, when I say wealth, I mean in terms of, um, you know, in a broad sense. And I think my my two boys came away from it and said, wow, you you know, that was amazing, Dad. So we just had lunch with, you know, a family or somebody with a family name that is so well known, and yet what we saw was tremendous humility and no mm -hmm. pretense. Um, it was just a real conversation. Warwick treated us no differently than, you know, if he were just uh, probably part of his family. Uh, my two boys got to know his, his uh, sons. They went for a little walk and they're just like, wow, this is just a normal family. And I think, Warwick, what I saw in that was to grow up in that environment um, and to stay grounded in that environment and, and to demonstrate the humility that you did and do I, I think is a testimony of your own character. And I think that's that's what impressed me, Gary, because I've seen, um, and again, not not to judge anybody, but I've, you know, I've seen through coaching many leaders now, hundreds of leaders, um, you know, that it's that's a very difficult thing. As leaders, it's difficult to live a life of humility because people sometimes are constantly trying to put us up on a pedestal and say, wow, mm -hmm. look at this person, you know. And yet in the midst of all of that, you know, Warwick managed to stay incredibly grounded. He knew who he was. He knew his values and what was important to him. And I think, you know, without me having to say anything, but my two boys driving away with me from a lunch with Warwick and his family, for them to say that, I thought, you know, that was perfect. You know, yeah. I, it's a teachable moment that I didn't even have to talk about because my kids just got it because they saw it. And Warwick, I'm I'm sorry if if that embarrassed you, no. but just recently we recorded an episode in which you talked about you said some of the same things very interestingly about your great great grandfather, the founder of the media company, John Fairfax. Right. So as I said on that show, um, the apple has not fallen far from the tree there. So well, it's back to um, you. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I mean, that means a lot to me, uh, Glenn, and that your boys would think that that's. Um, it's hard to express uh, how you know uh, what that means. Um, it, you know, it's funny. Uh, you know, values. I mean, virtues in your term, which I think is a good word. My two highest ones are you know uh, integrity and humility. I try and live every day that way. Obviously, not perfect. Some days, um, you know, may not meet the mark that I'd like to. But one of the things that's the greatest blessing in our lives is when you have your kids live the values, let's say virtues, that you hold most dear. There's yeah. fewer greater gifts than that. In this sense, you know, I look at John Fairfax, my great great grandfather, his level of humility, integrity, doing the right thing. I mean, it was off the charts. And so I don't know about, you know, talk about inheriting faith, which you, you know, can't really. But um, everybody has to make their own decision. But when I look at my three kids, are all adults. Uh, they all work very hard. They're humble. They're kind of they're from you know like thirty uh, two down to um, uh, down to twenties, and they're all out working. And they're sort of model uh, employees. They work hard. You you tell them to do something, it gets done. You never have to check up. Uh, yeah. If there's a problem, they'll tell you. They treat people well. I mean, the the virtues they're living uh, are the ones I most cherish. And mm -hmm. so, I don't know. I mean, the, I, I can't think of too many things in life that I get more immense satisfaction and pride 
I don't care so much about their business success and they're all doing well in their own way, but just when they're living their life in a way that's in line with, I don't want to say my values, but humility, integrity, you know, hard work. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense. I mean, I mean, I mean well, you that, probably that's, that's success, that too, that's success yeah. isn't it, Warwick? That's success. I mean, that's so you know what you just highlighted really is the is the heart of a father. You know that is success. Um, you know why divorce that from you know success in business and success in a different part of your life? I think there's greater value in in being able to say success is not just one part of my life. If I can, if I can see success as being so much more than just my career and my work, but actually it is my family. And yes, now I look at them having inherited and committing to a set of values that are going to set them on a trajectory that's important for them, um, you know, and they're, and they're living a life that's fully aligned with it. Then for me, uh, it doesn't mean that you've never failed as a father, but that still is success as a father. And so I think it's okay to, to own that. And as you said, it's a gift and to take great pride in that. Uh, and we shouldn't we shouldn't feel embarrassed by that in any way. I think that's and and you've modelled a gift of values for your family, and they've chosen to in, to take those those gifts, if you like, for themselves. And now that's created a great foundation for their future. And I think that's that's an important part of your success story. Well, thank you. Well. Uh, that <laughs> silence from Warwick uh, is, is a good indication. Is a good indication that uh, he's he's listened. He's heard the captain turn on the fasten seatbelt sign, indicating that the plane's going to land pretty soon. Um, I'm going to keep talking until he he, he regains his com his composure <laughs> enough to ask uh, his last couple of questions uh, because he he's not accustomed to that. Um, um, uh, praise on this show because he, he 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 deflects it because that's what someone with Warwick's character does. They they deflect that stuff. And I just upset the whole apple cart by asking you that question. So I feel kind of good about that. <laughs> Warwick, um, that is uh, time now. I think you're ready to go to ask uh, the last couple of questions to Glenn and um, and we'll be uh, we'll be wrapped. Yeah, I probably do have a couple more. There was one probably at the very end of the book in which there are some leaders who maybe they don't learn, they just get back on the horse, or uh, maybe some leaders will try to reevaluate. But then there are some that, you know, it's like, I've failed, I'm a failure, I give up on life. And there was a time when that was me. There was a time when, you know, uh, everything I touch, I screw up. I had zero self confidence. And I was playing small. Uh, listeners have heard this. I worked in an aviation services company in the '90s, early 2000s, doing you know strategic planning, some marketing analysis. But I was not. I was using a small percentage of my gift, and that's humility aside. It's factually true, and I felt like, from my own spiritual paradigm, I was not honoring God by play, playing small. That was not. Uh, it didn't make sense. So talk about. There may be leaders who are playing small. They say, look, I screwed up royally. Maybe I can help out with a soup kitchen, some small nonprofit. I'm not going to lead it because heaven knows I'll destroy it, but I'll just volunteer. I'll get the ladle out and nothing wrong with doing that. But I don't believe it's necessarily a good thing playing small and not using the gifts from my perspective that God has given you. So, Talk about that leader is kind of given up and playing small because, look, if I touch anything, everything I touch, I destroy. And that was me at one point. So talk about that leader that just feels so bad about themselves that they've given up and playing small. Yeah, and maybe just to, to expand on that a little, where it's not even necessarily they feel bad about themselves. I think there's, there's a, a genuine or a very sincere – um, sense that they don't want to experience hurt again. You know, they don't want to be hurt again. I get that. We all get that, right? None of us want to be hurt. Um, you know, they don't want to experience disappointment again because they're concerned about their capacity to, to deal with that. It's like, you know, maybe they've gone through numerous disappointments and maybe they've had a number of failures and they just don't want to put themselves at risk of those things happening again. 
And, and I understand that. I, I, you know, I get that. You know, none of us want to put ourselves out there to fail or to be disappointed intentionally or, or, or to be hurt. And, and yet at the same time, we know that we, we live in a world where, you know, that's, that's inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, and so, you know, for, for me, what I encourage leaders to do, it's not even a matter of thinking big or, you know, um, they, it could be well be, it could well be that they're not yet ready to think big. Yeah, you know, they're just they just try to they just try to see beyond what's what's immediately in front of them. They they're having enough trouble dealing with what they're in right now. So so you know, this is where the framing or reframing, you know, your story becomes really important. And, you know, we talk about mindset, we talk about the importance of self-talk, we talk about owning your strengths. And and so just taking little steps to say, look, okay, so I've experienced this this uh, disappointment, or I've experienced failure. Uh, but you know, coming back to some of the things we talked about earlier, but that doesn't have to define everything about. But I can choose to learn from that. And will I get hurt again and disappointed again, or will I potentially fail again? Yes, you might, but that doesn't have to define. That doesn't have to be the end of the world. Um, so, you know, w- we would encourage people to take small steps and to identify some of those, some of the ways they can reframe their narrative. And so if they've been hurt, you know, uh, you know, I was in a situation where I got hurt and people said some things about me that I didn't like or, um, you know, uh, I didn't appreciate and I just don't want to expose myself to those sorts of settings again. Um, I, I get that. But, you know, you could say, you know, that's going to happen again. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I do know who I am. I know uh, what I stand for. I know what's important. I know what my strengths are. And in fact, we often encourage leaders and people in going through a crisis to reframe their experience through a lens of their strengths. So um, we often use the example of the Clifton strengths. Gallup used their Clifton strengths assessment. Um, when you're in a crisis, often you have no awareness of your strengths. So, you know, if you're in a crisis, we say, look, take your, you know, take one of your top five Clifton strengths, and, and you know, if that's a strength of yours, how might you express that or demonstrate that today? Um, you know, so so again, it's just a matter of acknowledging and affirming what you, you know, who you are and what you have, that you don't have to throw your strengths outside the window. And as you exercise those strengths, no matter how small, but as you exercise those strengths, you start to regain and rebuild confidence. And I think you've got to allow yourself time to rebuild that confidence, not jump off the deep end to start with. Makes so much sense. Makes so much sense. Just one final question. We often ask sort of a, a word of hope and I would frame it this way. In the work you do at LCP Global, how do you provide hope, uh, maybe some healing, but how do you provide hope to the leaders you come alongside? Because you probably come along leaders who are hurting and uh, not always in a good place. They're confused and they may be lost in the desert. How do you provide hope through the work you do at LCP Global? Yeah. I think the, f- the first thing we do is we say, look, okay, let's draw a line in the sand. You know, things have happened in your life. Uh, they've not all been pleasant. Um, and, you know, and to a degree, they've actually helped define how you're currently thinking about your world and the, the lens that you use to look at your world, look at your relationships, look at your family, look at your workplaces. So, so if you can draw an imaginary line in the sand right now and say, okay, that's happened. What what would define success for me moving forward? Even if it's taking a bit, you know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote that book called Blink. You know, uh, again, you know, don't overthink things, right? And so, in a way, the blink test here would be in twelve months from now, maybe even in three months from now. What would success look like for you? Um, and I think just by trying to take away that sense of being overwhelmed by the existing narrative, drawing a line in the sand and saying. Okay, so no judgment, no shame. We get to start again. You get to start again and build new, new things. What would success look like in the next three months, in the next 12 months, whatever is a good time frame for that person? And we found just in, in reinforcing that principle, 
and focusing on the next 90 days in particular to see what changes can occur in the next 90 days, to see what uh, what successes, small wins, whatever you want to call it, in the next 90 days can go a long way to creating a, a, a new a new trajectory for that person. And so I think, you know, that brings hope because it says there's a line in the sand, there's a new future, um, there's a short-term thing that you can focus on, so focus on small wins to begin with. And I think there's also that hope because we're saying, listen, stop beating up on yourself. There's no shame. There's no judgment. You know, we've failed. You've been hurt. You've experienced disappointment, but that doesn't have to be what defines you moving forward in the next in the, in the coming days and months. I have been in the communications business long enough to know when the final word has been spoken on a subject, and Dr. Glenn Williams just spoke it on the subject. There's one little extra word you have to add, though, Glenn, and that is how can listeners find out more about your business and about your book? Where can they go online yeah. to find that? Well, thank you. Well, the, the book's quite easy. The book's available on Amazon, so that's uh, that's a nice, easy one. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, look, I just encourage you to take a look at the book, not just for yourself, but as a gift to somebody else. Uh, and, you know, let it be a blessing to somebody. Um, we all know people who, who are lost, you know, who are struggling in their, in their moment, in their crisis, and uh, I think this would be a great encouragement to them. Um, you can find out more about the work that we do with uh, with individual leaders, but also teams and organizations at uh, www.lcp-global.com. And that is a wrap. Listeners, thank you for spending time with us on this episode of Beyond the Crucible. And, and do remember this, and you heard it in the conversation between Glenn and Warwick here. Uh, we understand your crucibles are hard. They're difficult. They can make you feel like you don't want to, as Warwick says, don't want to get out of bed. They can make you feel like uh, your, your life, if not over, has certainly stalled. Here's the good news. You can write a new story, as Glenn explained here. And that story that you write from the perspective of Beyond the Crucible can be the, the most fulfilling story of your life, because where it leads is to a life of significance. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week.